Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, good to see you all, thanks for being here. Um, lots of people here already today, so that's awesome. Uh, thanks so much. That uh, Say hi to everybody, thank you BV for, for doing all this stuff on the side here. So today I wanna to start off with, um, I have a workshop coming up live this Saturday at 1 p.m. on Zoom. It's a ton of fun, I've done these before. And um, it's on playing the changes in a blues, applying the dominant seventh arpeggio over the changes. And if you can play a chord or two, if you can play the chords, you can actually do this. You can, it's not that difficult. And that's kind of the point of the workshop is to really break down the simplest way for you to be able to play blues changes while making the chord changes. And uh, you know, get it together pretty quickly and pretty easily. It's not, I used to be really mystified by the whole thing where it just freaked me out and I would just really be like, oh my God, what am I, how can I play all this stuff? Uh, and then I'm here to tell you, and I'll tell you on Saturday, it's not that hard to do. And part of that's gonna tie in with what we're talking about today. So first of all, uh, Quincy was on first. I don't know why it gets cut off, but Quincy was first. <laughs> so Ron Peterson, everybody's here. I got uh, Keith at Five Watt World. Of course, check out Keith tomorrow. He's got uh, our friend, uh, Rick Beato. And actually a little bit of history, I had met Rick. Um, I had introduced, he was trying to get a hold of Robin Ford and then I got in touch with him and I introduced him to Robin. And then in turn, he introduced me to Keith. So I know uh, Keith, who has become one of my really good friends through Rick Beato actually. So there you go. There's a, there's a little history for it. Like my, my vocals are, it looks like they're distorting. These lav mics can be really tricky sometimes. Cause if you speak a little loudly, I need a compressor on is what I need to do. So I can sound like a true DJ. Okay, so let's talk about today. Um, we're talking about here is practicing and then setting up a plan on how to practice. So the first thing what I, what I mean by that is uh, practicing is I find to be very difficult. Uh, playing all the time, I play guitar all the time, right? I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. You pick up the guitar and you sit there and you noodle and you get all the stuff and you can play for hours and then you feel like you've gotten nothing done. And the majority of the people coming to me for lessons have been playing for a really long time and then they feel like I'm completely stuck and I'm playing the same thing over and over again for 30 years or 20 years or 10 years, or whatever it is, and it seem to get no, no further on down the line. So the main thing that I would say is you need to make a plan, hence the title of this, uh, this broadcast. So when I, first thing I would say is you want to plan, well, you have to make a plan because then you want to walk into your practice session knowing what it is you want to work on. Because if you don't do that, you end up floundering. I know I do. You just start poking around this. You, you go on something like True Fire and you, know, you, you see these millions of lessons or you go on YouTube and you see 10,000 guys teaching you the stuff you want to play. Um, and then you do nothing or you get no better or you feel like you just spent hours and then you buy a pedal. <laughs> and you watch pedal demos because you think that's suddenly going to make you a better player. I know this to be true because I do the, I, I do the same thing, right? So sometimes I, uh, I, um, I, I fall into that rut as well. So the first thing I would say on my list of, um, I would have a little list. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll throw it on my, uh, my website. I just, I tried to put it up on the screen. I can't size it right. It, it's, my technology is not so great. So you make a plan. So plan on when to practice and put it in your calendar. All right, so I do this on my phone. I have a thing that's, I, I block out practicing at 9 a.m. Uh, to 10 at least. I try to do an hour a day uh, of practice. I play all day. I teach all day. I work on videos. The guitar is in my hand almost most waking hours. But that doesn't mean I'm practicing, right? That means I'm playing and that means I'm also maybe wasting some time, right? So I put aside the time to actually practice. And if you want to find more about this that I've learned a lot, I'm reading John Cleese's book on creativity. Now he has the luxury of putting aside five hours a day or three hours or four hours a day to work on something to try to do something uh, like to create a new movie or a script or a book some of us don't have that luxury so we have to make the time as we as we as we can so if you don't have you know an hour a day to practice that's okay this is where the plan comes in because if you plan on what you want to practice and we break it down in a way i'm going to talk about in a minute it actually facilitates and maximizes your practice time and then you feel like you actually accomplished something. So that's always really something that's really important, the thing I talk about in all my master classes and I hope I really pass along to everybody here that um, you can all do it, we can all do it. It's about focus and it's about how much time you put into the instrument is directly proportional, proportional to how much you get out of it. 
right? So, you know, I remember my friend at college, um, he's uh, my roommate at college, Dorian Hartsong. He plays bass in the, uh, uh, the Led Zeppelin thing with John Bonham's Led Zeppelin. He's the bass player, great bass player. And I remember him saying to me one morning, he's like, man, I totally figured out, you know, all these monster players. You need like, you know, like, you know, Eddie Van Halen or, or you know, Larry Carlton or someone like that. He goes, they all just practice their asses off. <laughs> and he's really, he's really right. But I would add to that by saying they practice their asses off, but in a very focused manner. So you want to practice with intent as opposed to just kind of sitting around and, and butting around doing the same thing. Okay. So plan, I also find that making it part of a, a regimen or a regime or whatever, <laughs> uh, practice the same time each day if you have that ability to do it. So for me, I find the best time for me to get on the guitar where I'm most focused as a practicer is in the mornings. I have my cup of coffee in the Jeff Mackerlane mug, available on the links below. Um, so I, I find myself that I, I work best. I got the coffee going on, I got the caffeine bump in my head, um, and I find that that's how I practice, when I do the most active work. At night, I find I have a harder time with that. At night is when I try to be more creative. That's when I can maybe write music or um, just kind of work on ideas or solo or sometimes like things like that. So for, um, for instance, like uh, some of the True Fire courses, um, when I write those solos out or any of my other courses that I did with Brett Pop and anything, uh, upcoming courses that I have, I find composing some of those solos works better for me at nighttime because I feel like I'm a little more creative. I might do the background track during the day and sometimes at night I feel like I can do, I could be a little more musical, if that makes any sense. But I'll plan on the stuff, okay. Um, and then you plan on how long you intend to practice. You have a half hour, you think about it ahead of time, you got an hour, you think about it ahead of time. So little things that I found when I start to practice is I use, and this is from an old teacher of mine um, who I've actually had on this show, Rusty Philippus, who's a, a great guy. I'll have him on a gag, I'll have him on again. Um, I am all about shameless plugs, uh, Michael, of course. That's how I make my living. Um, I use a timer very often. If I want to get something down that's different, I'll use a timer for three minutes. So it's just on my phone, you know, set a countdown timer for three minutes, and I'll practice that idea for three minutes. Um, and that really helps me to get away from distractions, right? So if I'm thinking, like, okay, I'm going to practice, you know, an arpeggio for three minutes. Now, you remember when, you know, you want to get out of work or <laughs> school is done, remember back then? You know, three minutes can take a really long time or it can whiz really by really quickly. So if I'm going to sit there and work on a, you know, a dominant seventh arpeggio, you know, and I'll go through it three, for like three minutes. Even if it's one finger, and I'll just keep on running over it again. And what I'll think about as I'm doing this is a number of things, thinking about the notes, thinking about the fingering, and I very often, I find this is really helpful for me when I practice, is I concentrate on one hand at a time, right? I'm not going for speed if I'm not practicing speed yet, you know, but if it's practicing the fingering, I'm gonna think about, okay, that finger there, you know, I'm playing this, I might think about the notes or the intervals, root three, five, flat seven, root three, five, Whatever way, whatever way you want to do it. You may say like, well, three minutes on that? Okay, maybe a minute and a half on that. You know, something where you're just setting a period of time where you're concentrating. Now, in that three minutes, you can go, you know. Right? You can think about ways to work around or to have fun with the, skit, with the arpeggio once you know the arpeggio. The other thing I really think about is I look at my hand, I kind of meditate on this right hand and it really helped me a lot to progress quickly when I'm trying to gain technique or learn something that's new to me. Um, I do this all the time still because I just find it maybe makes the synapses connect quicker in my mind. I don't know what it is, but if I really spend the time looking at my right hand, I can also find some of the problems, right? If I'm having a real issue getting a lick together or playing something smoothly, I will um, look at that right hand and then make sure that I'm picking things properly and, and uh, really concentrate on that. Because usually, 
If you're messing something up, like you have a hard time playing it, one, you're playing it too fast, that's pretty common. Secondly, and almost really most importantly, um, is you're probably doing it wrong. You know, so maybe you're picking it in a strange way or the fingering's bad or something like that. So that's something to think about. Now, I just saw that in my corner of my, uh, David Cromwell mentioned, do, what about a metronome? Uh, yes, I would definitely use a metronome for sure. But if you're just learning something, don't use the metronome. Learn the fingering, learn the scale, do it first, and then you can dig into the metronome. Because you don't want to add that added pressure yet if you feel like you're still working on a fingering. If you're really solid on... Yeah, yes, by all means, put on a, a metronome and start working through your eighth notes, triplets, and sixteenths, and all these different things. But the first thing I would do is actually make sure I know what it is I'm trying to play, right? Because if I'm kind of go... You've got this going on, as metronome's clicking, and I'm, I got all the stress being built up because I'm trying to play with a metronome, and I don't know what exactly what it is I'm trying to play. Okay, um, so next in here is um, plan on what you intend to practice. Okay, so we're just talking a little bit. I'm going to do a little, show you how I would practice something in a minute. I'm going to talk about um, incorporating some of those BB box ideas uh, that I've talked about in other videos and, you know, playing over A7 chord. So I'm going to work on that in a second. And then plan on taking a while to make it into your playing. That's super important, right? So you work on something, it doesn't automatically mean you're gonna have it on the gig or the next time you practice. The next time you practice, you might be like, oh man, where did it all go? It went, totally went out the window. Because you haven't internalized it yet. You're learning a language, that is the perfect analogy. And then you have the, the physical aspect of this stuff. So, you know, just because I, I learned, I took a few Spanish courses and practiced a few sentences, doesn't mean I can actually use them uh, in conversation yet. So you have to put that time in too. So then that brings us to you practicing with tracks, and the ultimate thing is playing with people. I'm getting hit. Okay, so, um, and I, I said, okay, so plan on taking a while to get in your playing, and then plan on repeating, repeatedly practicing that idea. Like, okay, you practiced it yesterday, then you, got to go, you want to do it again today, and you want to do it again the next day, and you want to keep on doing it. You might not have to spend as much time as you did on it the first few days, but you also want to keep on revisiting it, because then it really starts to internalize. Um, and as good as you think you are at it, there's somebody better, right? <laughs> you know, like, I think I've got some stuff under my hands, and I listen to, you know, play with Robin Ford, and I go, yeah, yeah, he's got a lot more stuff under his hands than I have under mine. So, no matter how good you have, there's, o there's always some way to play it better or differently or a nicer, a different approach or way to change it up. Okay, and then okay, so plan on messing it up. To you, like you gotta be really, you gotta be really happy. Like you gotta go really softly on yourself with this stuff because it's so easy to uh, to mess up. You just gotta be cool with it. Oh, messed it up. You're not performing. You're practicing. Super important, right? So when you see guys on the the YouTubes and they show their or the internet, right? Or uh, I'm thinking Instagram, like the one minute videos. Do you think those guys just improvise that? Maybe some of them did, but most of the people, most of those videos when you see this guy play from top to bottom, plays this amazing sort of arranged piece perfectly with the most amazing technique you've ever witnessed. I w it took me a while to kind of go, oh, wait a minute. How many takes of that did they do? A lot of takes, and they practiced it. So there's, what you don't see is the, you know, the hundreds of takes that's on their camera or their phone that, that they messed up. Now, of course, I never do that. Everything I do that you see is the first take and it's played perfectly every single time. <laughs> so, as my nose grows. Um, totally not true. I will take my time. You know, I'm not going to put anything on the internet that's me having hitting a clam. But, as you watch some of these older videos of me from live, I just kind of go with it. I, I'm pretty cool with making mistakes, especially when you hear, you know, the perfection stuff is not real. You know, uh, when you go see anybody, I've heard them make mistakes. So it's all it depends on, you know, the level of mistake, right? You hit a, a bad note or an open string or something. It happens all the time. Because what I think about is when you're improvising, and it's what I'm, it's really kind of coming from a jazzier background, that's what's close to my heart. And for me, improvising is everything. So uh, sometimes it seems very odd to me to have to compose a solo. All right, so, um, but I do like composing solos. And it's one thing I have learned, that there's nothing wrong with composing solos because it turns out all my favorite guitar solos were composed, <laughs> right? Think about that, like Pink Floyd, I love Pink Floyd, of course. David Gilmour didn't improvise the solo you hear on the records. It might have been based upon an improvisation and he listened back and pieced together the solo, but the final take was not like this thing that he just banged out. 
other things are, you know, like Cream, you know, Crossroads. I mean, a live solo in Crossroads, one of the greatest guitar solos of all time, that was improvised. But he practiced that stuff a million times, right? So there's my point. He's improvising, but he's practiced it a million, million times, right? He didn't just get up there and go, yeah, I'm just going to try this. What's his pentatonic scale? Oh, yeah, let me do that. Everything you heard him do, he has done before, but maybe not quite in that order. And by the time you heard that version of Crossroads, it's a really famous one. If you listen to a lot of the, uh, the versions of it that are available, especially on the Cream uh, the Farewell Tour, they released a whole bunch of the bootlegs that were coming out. There's some not so great versions of it. I mean, truth be told, you know, not some great nights. Some nights he just sounds great. Other nights he's not sounding so great, you know. Um, okay. Don't self-edit while you're practicing. So this is part of the plan, right? I'm going to practice. I'm not performing. If I mess something up or if it's not what I planned on doing, that's okay. Just go with it and then go bring back the focus. That's where the three-minute thing really works well for me. I turn that back on and it brings me back into focus. I'll just work on something for three minutes. And when my mind starts to, to wander, which it almost inevitably does, um, I, I will either slow down what I'm doing or I'll just say like, okay, what well, well, I got like a minute and 30 seconds left. I can do that, right? And then take a three-minute break or a one-and-a-half-minute break in between. Whatever feels good. But I find really, really using that three-minute thing has been super helpful for me. And I keep on forgetting it. And then I keep on coming back to it. I'm like, well, how did I forget this? This is really useful. Um, make sure you have no distractions. This is my biggest problem. And, you know, I need that. This is like coffee talk here, right? This is my biggest problem. Is you have your phone, you've got your internet, and my a lot of my stuff to play my, is hooked up to the internet, you know, like, so I have to make sure I turn off my, um, I have to make sure I turn off my messages because, you know, I'm trying to run a business as well and I got Keith texting me every morning. <laughs> you know, so you have to make time for these, these things where you just turn off everything and just focus in on the instrument. I cannot practice, like really practice, when anybody's in the room with me. So I have my area. Other really little things, guys, all the stuff is out. Um, whether you have all your guitars out, if the guitar is not out, you're not going to play it, right? So I have everything ready to go. I've got my Axe effects, which I use primarily to practice, or the, you know, the T-Rock over there. Um, and here's my easy Axe primarily practice. It's got the looper, it's got everything. It's just super easy. I just turn on the computer, turn on my interface, and I'm, I'm up, up and running. I use the two rocks all the time too, but sometimes, you know, it's nice and low volume. So I have everything ready to go. So if there is any, you guys could probably understand. So I go into the gym, kinda, is, um, is getting started is the hardest part. So if you have the guitar that you wanted to use and it's in a case, you're not gonna use that guitar and you might just not practice. So that's one thing I've learned is all my guitars are sitting right over here and ready to go. All right, uh, so make sure you have all, no distraction. Turn off the electronics. Excuse me, and if you're in a household, you know, try to find the time you've got kids. Fortunately, my, my kid is not um, young anymore. Well, he's 16, he's young, but he's not a toddler. That was really hard to find, you know, because your time is not your own at that point. But I try to say everybody, I'm, I'm practicing. I know when, once he goes to school and you know, my wife is working, I just get up, I try to do some practicing. Because once it gets past that time of day, I'm shot. I don't have any time to practice. And I don't have the mental energy to practice really well at night. Because I've used that mental energy uh, teaching or working on videos or things like that. So I don't have that focus like I do in the morning. So um, the main thing, and the main, main thing I have in big print here in my thing is you have to do the work. It's easy to say I want to be a great guitar player. It's easy to think that can happen by watching countless YouTube videos and taking True Fire courses and, and, and all the things that I love that you guys support me doing. But what I hope it comes across when I teach in all of my uh, avenues that I teach and venues that I teach is that it's about the time you have to put in. And if you put in a little time and you focus on a little, little bit, and this is the final thing on this, I'll just give an example. If I focus in on a little idea, right, and I'll show you this in a second, and I just really, really dig in on that and don't do anything else, I'll get more out of that than I will practicing this bigger concept. Because you can start to dig in. So I'll show you an example. 
All right. Um, uh, I'll get to it. Again. Lots of cool questions. Lots of people here. Thanks everybody for being here. I really appreciate it. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Notice the guitar is being delivered. Please ring the doorbell. Well, there's those sort of things. Um, okay. I just want to address this. This is um, a Michael Tuttle. This is a. This is actually not mine. It's uh, if you see uh, Sons of Sound on here sometimes. My friend Jeff is a really good friend of mine. I have a few Tuttles and. I am, I'm on a, a Tuttle quest and Michael and I are going to put together a signature model. Here's the, uh, the idea behind it. Um, is I, I did pick this up uh, on a bunch of trades of things. It's a Guthrie Govan Charvel. And it is spectacular. It's a great, great guitar. Um, but uh, I love it and I'm really, really happy with it. But it's, it's very modern sounding and there's nothing wrong with that. That's just what it is. You got the kind of Floyd on here and it's toasted maple, roasted maple, whole thing. So it's a really great guitar. I'm not a huge fan of the 24 frets and a humbucker, but the guitar is so much fun to play and I'm really digging it. So it, when I realized this is kind of a funny thing, which seems kind of stupid, I, I teach so much blues online and all stuff, but my gig, if you saw some of the videos from Europe, is a fusion gig, really. So I just wanted to get back to a little bit more of some of the guitars that I played when I was younger, a little more uh, shreddy, but I miss a very traditional guitar sound. So Michael's work is fantastic. I've been friends with Michael for 15 years and he makes, I've got a number of his guitars as you guys know. So we're working on putting together a signature model, um, which is a mixture of modern and old sensibilities. So I'm really excited about that. And um, my friend Jeff was cool enough to let me borrow this because this is a different neck profile that I'm used to playing and it may be a combo that I'm going to use. So that's what this is. And it's a really great guitar. So of course all of Michael's guitars always sound great. Right? So, super cool. So the signature model will be coming. I have no idea. We're just starting talking about it because uh, my point was some of the fusion-y things, my regular title that you see me play all the time in some of those videos, great guitar, 10 inch radius. I think I wanted maybe like a 12 to a 16, which is super modern, the kind of thing I grew up playing, which facilitates certain things. And this is something that's interesting we could talk about. I have another guitar that I, that I picked up because I went crazy. I got... <laughs> I'm a huge Jakey e. Lee fan since I was a kid. And I got um, uh, the Jakey e. Lee Charvel. This is the Mexican version. Great guitar. Um, just because like a childhood fantasy. I love his guitar playing. I've always wanted this guitar. And they came out with it. And um, this, I put nines on it. It brought the 30th Street. We put the action pretty low. And as you've seen Rick Beato's video probably about string gauges and the lighter string gauges sound differently, most definitely. And although at the end I can, I can play these and we can hear the differences, which is fun. So I put nines on this and it sounds like 80s shred, which these other ones don't quite sound like that because I'm using tens. So huge Jake fan. These are great guitars. I found a little bit of a problem. Um, to some of them, the quality control on some of them, I played a few and a few of them were not so great. That Govan right off the shelf was amazing. I got it with my friends over at Safe Haven Guitar, Safe Haven Music out in Long Island. I went there and, and checked it out and I pulled out a few and they had it in stock and it was, it was great. But that's inspired me to talk to Michael about getting something a little more modern. And, um, you know, and plus this is, this is Guthrie's thing. But the 24 frets with the humbucker is not my favorite thing because I can't get that... My favorite guitar, is gonna, like, guitar sound is that neck pickup on a Stratocaster. And, um, you know, other things. That's Guthrie's guitar. So, anyway. When is my shred record coming? Ah, uh, at some point. This is, okay, so this is another thing. Um, trying to find time to write music. We can talk about that in a minute. Okay, so I have a bunch of questions. People are like, how do you work on phrasing? I'll get to all these questions in a minute. Um, uh, Sig Color Sonic Blue. I'll, I'll take con uh, color options. I want it to be kind of something different. So when we do it with Michael, it's just going to be, um, that's the guitar. Like there's no substitutions, right? Maybe color, but we're just going to do it as a run of the guitars. So it'll be coming out at some point, uh, but it will be, um, okay, Larry Lambert. I love the guitar, Guthrie, but you couldn't handle not being able to adjust the bridge pickup. Yeah, the pick, right, exactly. There's a few things about the guitar that I'm not crazy about. The pickups are, are, are into the wood, and I think it sounds cool, but you can't raise the height, and I'm very particular about the pickup height. 
And people may ask, well, how high do you have your pickups? I have it to where I think it sounds good. I don't have any scientific way of doing it. I just play that pickup and bring it and lower it down and go, oh, I think that sounds good. That's how I do it. So, okay. So one of the most important tools when you were practicing is a looper. All right, so I'm gonna show you how I practice with a looper and I'll show you how to use a looper in a second. Super important um, to use a looper and have it in your pedal board. I have one in my Axe FX and I really like it. So, excuse me. The looper allows me to practice small things because you have know, all these background tracks that you can get off my website, now with charts. Um, but the looper is great because it allows you to uh, practice one specific thing when you want to practice it, right? I need something to practice, I'm gonna do this right now. Okay, I'm gonna get my looper. So, I'll restart a loop. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an A7 band. Time's right. Time's always a problem looper. Pretty good. Okay, cool. So how I did the loop, let's talk about that real fast, because loopers are a mystery to me at first. Always play your groove first, right? What you want to solo over. I'm just playing this little vamp, A7. Right. And my time is, right? And it's a one and two and three and four. Okay, so I'm gonna hit the looper on beat one, it's a two bar phrase, and I'm gonna hit the looper on what would be beat one of bar three. So the loop, like, so here's the loop right here, there's the loop two bars, but you start, you, you hit the loop end on beat one of bar three, and it actually just sounds like you're on beat one of bar two. All right, so you're actually, you're punching, repunching this note, so it circles properly. If you try to end the loop before bar that downbeat, you're gonna you're gonna drop it by a sixteenth note or a thirty second note or something like that. There's um, uh, it takes a little while. The trick, of course, is you got to practice it. But to play the groove first, don't play too long a groove because sometimes in your time might get kind of nutty. I've done that. I think I've even done it live here. I've been playing a blues and then I go back and try to solo over it, and my my time went out the window. So a short loop. And uh, some people ask, what's my favorite looper? Uh, this is the one that's in the Axe FX. This is the FM3 on the floor with the uh, FX, FC6 extension pedal. It's got a great, that's why I love this thing. It just, everything's ready to go. Um, there's so many good loopers. Inexpensive one, the TC one, inexpensive quotation marks. The Boss ones, I just prefer the ones that have two switches, like the on and off. I have the, the Ditto by TC, the Mini, and you have to hit the switch twice. Bit of a pain in the butt. I'm used to it, but I prefer the ones that you can hit back and forth. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about just this little phrase. This kind of BB King thing, where I wanna work on some of the phrasing, I wanna make sure that I can play that. So I just loop one chord. practicing here. I'm going to practice something very specific. My plan is to work through this sound, really get it under my fingers. And the only way you're going to do that is to beat the crap out of it, right? Keep on playing it. Think about every variation you could possibly think of. So here I'm just playing A, B, and I'm bending up to C sharp, right? I'm playing over C7, A7 chord. So I'm playing the A, which is the root of the chord, and the B up to the C sharp. So I'm going to sit there and think about how I can keep on doing that. I'm going to enter with this F sharp because it sounds cool. Right? I'm practicing my bend. So everything I'm doing right now, I've practiced individually. My vibrato. Just go in with it, right? Where did my ear want to hear 
to that. I think we that go. Make a little melody. Where does that want to go in my ear? Now it may seem kind of boring after a little while. I made a little mistake, that D, not great. So this is the point. You, by making these little mistakes, and by practicing this single idea, I hit that D. Well, that D, not bad, but it's not the good note. Where does that want to go? Or, so what I do is by practicing just a simple idea and not editing while you practice, like I said earlier, you practice in recovering from mistakes, right? So to me, this is a ton of fun. And so does it get boring playing over that one chord? It can, but then you're not doing it right most of the time. Look, some days you're just gonna get bored, that's fine, whatever. Try something else, do something else that day. But if you're doing it for like two minutes and you're like, yeah, I've run out of ideas, then you're not, you're not doing it right. You need to think about all the variations you can um, you know what I mean? You think about all the, the variations you can do and start to work through it. So there I said, like I made that D. Eh. That's the fourth in the scale, not a very good sound. So, mental note, the fourth does not sound good. You're gonna make mistakes. So then my, the, tri the challenge I try to work out is how do I get my way out of that? So I'm gonna purposely hit that D and see what I can do. So it really comes down to, I can use it as a note, but I just have to get off of it and use it as a resolution note. It's a passing note at that point. So if I keep on adding that in, or and I think you understand what I'm saying, you're, you learn how to get out of the mistake. So you're practicing screwing up, right? And recovering is the biggest thing in the world. So when you hear like really great players play and, uh, you know, you, they think, you know, someone's like, oh man, I think there's some mistakes, and you're like, I didn't hear anything, because, of course, your perception is different. But it's also, you're, um, you've learned how to recover. Really, really big. Really, really big. To be able to do that. So, um, it's kind of the stuff I, I did want to cover today. I'm just taking one little idea, and then I'm going to expand upon it, right? I'm going to try this, and, okay, so let's say I've done this right here. Well, right? Yeah. Whoa, got me. See? It's the same lick, so what am I going to do? Maybe I'm going to take that same idea and move it to different positions. Wow. That sounds really different, doesn't it? Same notes, but the timbre is different. So to me, that's cool. And then, if someone do. Different octave, but. So by taking that one little germ of an idea and making the plan that I'm just gonna, just gonna practice that today. Because if you get that, then you're starting to really build upon everything. And you get that under your fingers and then you're like, well, then the ideas start to flow a lot more easily. But once again, it's, it's putting in the time and not being discouraged and not, um, I mean, there's no mystery. Yes, 
great guitar players and the people we love, you know, the real legends. There's something going on. There's like that X factor, we want to call it. But none of them didn't not practice their butts off. None of them. Like they can say, oh, I don't really practice. Or I never really, I don't know how to read music and all these weird things. It's all nonsense. They all practice a lot. It's what their concept of what practicing is, is the different thing. And most of us are not them, right? So, I mean, not everybody's Hendrix. I'm not, and I feel like I, you know, do I have a natural ability for the instrument? Maybe, but I also practiced a lot, and I still do. And that, that can make up for all sorts of stuff. But I learned fairly early on, and through the benefit of doing a lot of teaching, is that if I practice specifically smaller ideas and start to build upon them, I, I, I became much better much more quickly. Okay, so let's uh, get some questions and some hanging. Thanks, so everybody, for being here. Once again, BB, thanks so much for being here. Keith, 5 Watt World. Uh, Larry Lambert, we got here. Ron Peterson, thanks. Um, uh, the Panda, right? The, the, yes, with the favorite Blueberry. Steve Moore, what's going on? Paul Bardford, L and M Guitar Corner, you're, take, you're taking off. But okay, catch it on the replay, man. <laughs> Jeff Harper, all right, everybody's here. Joey Bernowski, what's up? Michael Cope, good advice. Um, thank you. Don't forget my workshop coming up this weekend. I'm making the changes on the blues diamond seven, applying diamond seven to arpeggio. Lots of concepts like this, and keeping it really small and simple to make you to give you the confidence to be able to start to outline chord changes. It's not difficult. I thought it was difficult for many, many years, and that fear stopped me from really delving into something that is actually not that hard. Scouts on. Okay. So questions, um, any advice on how to best use your courses in a practice session? What can I do to get the most from a course and my time? Okay, that's a great question. Thanks uh, for picking up the courses, Martin. Um, take one idea, just one, one idea from the course. And if you're learning, say, like a solo from the course, just first thing I would say is be able to sing the solo in your head, listen to it a few times, be able to kind of sing it so when you're trying to work through something, you know what it's supposed to sound like as opposed to taking a stab at it. Uh, also, learn the chord progression. If it's a blues, be able to play the blues along with the tracks and you feel like you, you, you know what it is that you're playing over. I would not go any further. Even if, you, if you're learning a solo, and here's the thing about those, the, the courses sometimes, and I think I say it in the classes and sometimes I, I should always say it. If you get one idea from one of the examples, say in a True Fire course or the Brett stuff or um, the stuff I'm going to be putting out, you just... Then you scored, then that was it. You're, you've achieved a goal for that day, right? If you just got one idea that's starting to get into your playing, then it's spectacular. That's really, really important. And I think that that's something to think about when you're, when you're doing this too. Um, uh, or when you're going through a course, just do the one idea. Don't, don't think about it, I gotta finish this whole course, I gotta do this whole thing, I'm only on episode one or lesson one. Don't worry about it, take your time and just try to get the most out of what you're, what you're working through. Um, now, that would be it. Or if you have a limited amount of time and there's a fast lick or a cool lick that you want, then just do that, right? Just, just work on the one lick. That's gonna be much easier than memorizing the whole thing because that makes it very difficult to use. Then try to apply it, right? Just try to play that lick all over the place, try it in a different key, things like that. Seems really, really, it's really, really helpful. And that's it, you set the goal for the day, right? You make that plan of like, oh, today I'm just gonna really make sure I can play that lick. I really like that thing he did. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. And if it takes you 20 minutes, takes you five minutes, takes you a half hour, it doesn't matter. Because uh, however long it takes you, takes you. And I guarantee you, well, try to guarantee you, within a relatively short period of time, it will take you less and less time to do that because you're developing the skills of your ears and your muscle memory, right? And the fingerboard, you're developing all the things you need to do to play fluently on the guitar. So the more you, more you practice something with intent, the more it's gonna come out in your playing and the easier your development's going to be. Um, all right. You see, you got any other questions? Phil Kagey is a master of loop thing. Yeah, and, and, and Schofield just put out a record, uh, a jazz record with the looping. Jimmy Dell, what's up, man? Um, Daryl V, thanks for doing these videos. You're quite welcome. Um, do you track your practice at all? I'll a journal or a Word document. I don't. I'm not that organized, you know? Um, but I will sometimes, I will always have something in mind. And when I'm talking about practicing, like I'll sit down and watch TV, you know, bless my wife for not having a problem and then I'll plug in, but to sit on the couch, there's, there's, 
you know, I remember Larry Carlton saying this in a video really early on, that Starlix video, which is still amazing. Um, always have the guitar on you. I always have the guitar on me, so I know how the spatial relationship, you know, <laughs> Like I was sometimes when you see somebody like a student, okay, oh, try a guitar. And I'm like, sure. And they, they're like moving around. You're like, ah! or somebody doesn't know their guitar. Like they don't understand the spatial relationship of the guitar. And you're like, don't hit my guitar. Um, so for this, like, you know, I just, by having it in my hand all the time, I just know where everything kind of is. And by watching TV and playing scales and things like that. Um, when I say watching TV and playing scales, I already know what the scales are that I'm trying to play. I'm at that point, fortunately. And I remember um, Itzhak Perlman, the great violinist, saying that his favorite time to practice is during basketball season. So, because he just sits there and runs those scales. Um, okay. Uh, listening uh, it, it work while setting up guitars, how appropriate. Excellent. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Hey Tim, what's going on? Tim Ferriss just got here, damn it. Well, I'm, I'm here for a while longer. With the idea of practicing small ideas, how would you incorporate in a more neo-soul sound into your blues? I have no idea. I, I don't have any concept of neo-soul whatsoever. <laughs> that's, like a, that's like a new guy thing. Um, it's, it's not, you know, there's guys who play it great. It doesn't, I'll leave that for somebody who's better at that. It doesn't enter my guitar playing in any way. But if you wanted to enter your guitar playing and you learn a few neo-soul vocabulary ideas like licks and then put it into a blues, like you have to, you have to put in a time to see how you can make it work. Because somebody could show you how to do it. I mean, God, there's so many great guys who do that style. Um, that the only way to get it is to, to sit there and, and, and play it over the changes. So I'm not knocking that style. I just, I just have no idea how to play it. Okay, um, Larry Lambert, the question. Most important things to practice to audition for a house band that hosts jams? Oh, it's a great question. What would, you look f um, what would you look for that would make one guitarist in the crowd that stand out in the crowd? Okay, that's a good question. So the first answer would be I would find out, I would talk to the, the, the person who's running the, the jam, what, what, um, what tunes they know. Right? Um, know all their tunes. Like, just bust your butt. Be over-prepared. That's always the thing. That's how I sometimes get gigs. You just go there and, I mean, I can't imagine. Well, I have done. I've gone, I've, yeah, that's how you learn. I've gone remember going to some gigs unprepared and thinking, my talent will carry me. And if you don't know the tunes, you don't know the tunes. And your ta talent can't cover it that. So the main thing is if you go and you have all the songs together, ask them for a set list practice the crap out of them, memorize those tunes, as many of them as you can, it's super important. Go to a few gigs if you can and figure out what you think is missing. Like if they have a rhythm guitar player, right? Say that oftentimes the guy who runs it might be the guitar player. And let's say they're singing, very often they might play something, you know, they're talking about blues, they might be going, right? And that's the last thing you want to play. So I would work on, you know, you're getting your rhythm guitar playing. Right? Like that, that's how I get gigs, because I can do that. Um, and very often, like, a, uh, like those Hendrixy kind of rhythm fills, uh, those little things that make you the, the MVP of the night, it really often comes down to your rhythm guitar play. Okay, so also the second half of that question, hopefully that answers, and what would you look for that would make one guitar stand out from the crowd? I've talked about this in a number of uh, courses and a number of live feeds. Uh, the three T's, time, tone, and I was going to say touch, right? What I mean by that, or in tune, you know, time, tone, and tune, in tune. <laughs> so time is super important. So I want to hear, like, so if I'm just playing that loop again, right?
right? As opposed to. You know, like, I'm, I, I can't play. I can't play in between bad. You know what I'm saying? If I'm playing like that, it, that may be exaggeration. But if somebody is just kind of playing with no relationship to the time, I'm out. Can't deal with it. I'm like, okay. I'd rather hear somebody play very little, very minimally, and play well. So what am I playing well? The time, where the beats are really kind of refined, more refined playing. Playing in tune, I don't mean this way. Well, of course, that's a, that's a prerequisite. That's like the lowest thing <laughs> you should be in tune. But if someone's bends are out of tune or the vibrato's out of tune or something like that, I can't, I, I'm out. I can't do it. It kills me. Um, and then um, when I was saying tone, right? Uh, that for me is a, that's the third in a line. Um, but I want it to be something that's pleasant to my ears. All right, that's a big deal for me. If somebody's got good hands, that the expression to me is good hands. Like, I'm trying to think of, you know, what do I, I mean, you can't say someone like, I think B.B. King's exact is the, the, the ultimate of this. Like, he's got, he's got good technique and he's, you know, he's not a, a shredder in any way or a Pat Metheny or Ingve or anything like that. Uh, though that great B.B. King shreds is really fun on, on YouTube where he does like an Ingve tune. Um, his time is amazing. It's all his own. His touch and the vibrato, all those things, right? They're just so great that he could just sit there and go, you know, and you're like, what else do I need? So that's what I look for, someone who has, a, has put in the time, right? And is not just up there just plowing through it, you know? Um, so it's awareness of those things. Most important thing, that's what I would say. And that's how you keep the gig, right? Those are the guys. The fast stuff wears out, you know what I mean? Um, it just wears out. If someone just sitting there ripping the whole time, you're like, okay, I've heard that before. Uh, someone says, do I give online guitar lessons? I, I, I do. Um, I'm, I'm laying off of it for a little bit because I'm starting the channel. I'm going to have a subscription channel that I'm working on. So you can uh, work with me through that and these online workshops. Um, it's just amount of... I'm the, the hours in the day, you know, um, and I love teaching, but uh, I, through the YouTube channel, and I've been so overwhelmed by how many people, the reaction that people want to learn more uh, through me, with me, that I'm trying to figure out ways to cover a bigger swath of people, um, which is overwhelmingly, I'm overwhelmingly appreciative of that you guys contact me and come back here every week or every other week. So thank you. Um, okay. Um, I, have a, I have a recliner Strat with a Fender Mustang micro headphone and a great one sports around. Yeah. Um, okay, Tim. Okay, okay, sorry. You probably missed this and I misspelled it. <laughs> I can't stop noodling. And what I practice doesn't always show up in my playing. Okay, yeah. All right, so that's, I'm glad you brought that up, Tim. Um, noodling... You got to think about, like, if we're talking about language, right? Music's a language. So if somebody sits down and kind of plays some nonsense, I have that with students. I'm like, well, why did you play that? What was that? Was that worth playing? So everything I play, I'm not precious about it. Like, oh, everything I play is... No, everything I play, hopefully, is what I meant to play. Because if not, you're speaking gibberish, right? If you're like, blah, 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 right? That's like going, you know, this jam, this loop, and you're like, you know... Right? It's like, you're just, what is that? That's something that your fingers do that has, it sucks. So what I would do, when we talk about noodling. So how do you noodle? What's going on? Are you, um, that's a lack of focus. Totally. Um, so what you would do, I would recommend to him like the few minute thing. I'm just like, there's one little lick. I'm just going to work on that. And I refuse to do anything I'm, I'd, I would normally do. So it's a discipline thing. You can put roadblocks in your way, like if you find you're just picking a lot, then put your thumb, use your thumb, put the pick down, right? I'm only gonna play ace notes, I'm gonna play as simply as possible. I'm going to learn this B.B. King lick, or Stevie Ravon, or Albert Collins lick, or Ingve Malmsteen, like whatever the hell it is. It's one idea, and I'm gonna try to use it, and use it, and use it. And then I'm gonna try to make it my own, and I'm gonna try to vary it. But I'm not gonna play anything other than that. And then those are those kind of rut busters that, you, that help me get out of it. Um, this is where things like, you know, True Fire and like my 50 Licks courses come in pretty handy. 
in the sense of, I just want to learn a new lick. Okay, well, I like that lick. Okay, boom, then that's your assignment for the day. If it takes you an hour, it takes you a half hour, great. Then you, you got something done. So hopefully that helps, Tim. It's a good question. Um, Jimmy Dale, how would you practice songwriting? Some guys just knock out songs. They really find it struggling to get started. I wish I had a really good answer to that. I often need um, a fire under my butt to, to create, to write songs. So with, if you notice, if you have my first record and you have my second record that I did with Robin, some of the songs are the same, which I wasn't crazy about. But um, I was crazy about because they were played with Robin and they were different. So I was ha happy about that. And there was a few songs that I wanted to have Robin play on that were cool. But um, there was a limited amount of time because he had to go on the road. So he's like, I love that tune. Let's do that tune. And I'm like, okay, you know, let's do this record. So, but normally I have to have something, a, a deadline, uh, whether it's self-imposed, like, okay, I'm going to record a record in a month. I need five tunes. And then once again, you need, that's where the, like the, that's something that John Cleese was talking about, I mentioned earlier, that's when I need hours of time. Like you, because it takes you a while to get into that mindset of working on a tune. But things that help me, if it's just little rut busters, is I will not try to write a song like somebody else necessarily, but I might steal a drum groove from something. Like, man, I love the feel of that tune. So I'll open up my Logic, and I've got uh, Easy Drummer, which is freaking great. Easy Drummer 3 is really cool. And I'll just find a similar drum beat and then try to write something to that. So I use little things like that that, that try to help me along. Um, some people say they can bang out songs. Yeah, I think that's also, I don't think, I think that's not true, honestly, Jimmy. I think that's our perception. Like, does Paul McCartney bang out songs? Nope. He's talked about, I've heard him interviews, he sits down every day and goes to the craft of writing songs and throws away the majority of them. So, um, I've heard, you know, think about great songwriters, you know, Elton John says the same thing. You know, they just work through it and throw away way more than they end up using. But those guys are craftsmen, you know, that they sit down and they do this all the time. I think some of the problems that we have as guitar players, we're so into being guitar players, you know, I love shredding, I love playing the guitar, that the songwriting gets in the way of it, you know, or not, the songwriting gets overshadowed, but I always try to remember that my favorite guitar solos are in my favorite songs. So I try to think about that. So I think for me, it's a very difficult process when I get the, the the, if, the, if I have a goal and I have something I need to write some material for, that's when I'm most active and that's when I do it. If not, I'll just, I practice all the time, but writing songs is very difficult for me as well. It may be easier for some other people, but it's not easy for anyone. Um, and I think anybody who just bangs out tunes left and right, are those people? Maybe, but maybe not all that great songs, right? But nobody... <laughs> It'll come every once in a while, even more like the Bee Gees talking about, they wrote Stayin' Alive and the amount, amount of time it took to sing the song, which is maybe true or not, maybe an exaggeration, but whether you like Stayin' Alive, it's a great song, right? Um, so it happens, sometimes lightning strikes like that, but for the most part, no. And lightning only strikes like that is if you put in all the hours of work before that, right? Working on other tunes, so you're starting to develop the craft and honing your skills. All right. Um, the plane of changes masterclass is 90 minutes, and it usually ends up running like two hours. It's 90 minutes answering questions, and I usually just, if people are asking questions, we just go on. Um, this is the masterclass I'm having this weekend uh, that bb has been posting about. And if you can't make it live, it's okay. You can watch it on the repeat. It's if you uh, enroll in the, the course or the masterclass, you can watch it anytime you want at your own convenience. So, um, all right, let me jump ahead. Uh, Okay, Scott Moorhead. Hey, man, how you doing? Uh, I can't seem to gain any sort of mista uh, mistakeless speed doing simple things like scales. Is it more muscle memory than anything else? Yeah, it is really big muscle memory thing, for sure. Yeah, and um, I think, unfortunately, the older we get, sometimes the harder it is to develop that muscle memory. Things I don't overlook, my friend, that, you know, I had the joy of, you know, living in my parents' basement in the shred era. So I spent a lot of time, excuse me, honing those skills very early on when I had an unlimited amount of time and the focus that only a, uh, a teenager has, you know what I mean? Like that, I've got nothing else to do as long as I had my homework done. I had a great mom growing up, uh, still do, fortunately, um, who was 
basically, as long as I didn't screw up in school, I could do whatever I wanted. And so uh, that was great. Never, you know, the guitar words, you knew that was it for me. So I, I just had to, they, as long as I didn't do poorly in school, never took the guitar away from me or anything like that. I would get in trouble other ways, but never took the guitar away. So um, then it was just that really magical time in guitar playing uh, that I kind of miss, but got overdone with all the shred guys, but it was a really exciting time. So I'm on a tangent there, but I did have the opportunity to practice a lot when I was young to build up the technique. It, it, it takes more time as you get older, unfortunately. But yeah, it is muscle memory, yeah. Uh, any advice on how to remember what you practice? Are there any approaches to memorize chords, licks, solos, uh, or is it just putting the hours? Hey man, that's a great question. Lots of good questions today. I'm really, wow, this is awesome. Um, repetition, 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 repetition. Um, that's big. That's what I was talking about before. Like, and I, my Liz, like, you know, don't, you plan on messing up and plan on repeating it from now till the end of time till it really becomes part of your playing. On a gig, uh, this is a friend, a friend of mine gave me some cool advice a while ago and I have followed this. Is there something new that you wanted to do and you find you're not, if you're on a gig, which is the best way to learn. Difficult, I know. Um, the biggest leaps in my playing I got in, in the past few years was uh, playing on the road with Robin and then playing on the road in the Czech Republic with my friends because that's, that's real street fighter stuff at that point, you know? But, um, if I really wanted to do something, and I would remember, I put a little note on my pedal board. Diminished lick, or something, or just diminished, like, to, oh yeah, that's that thing I was working on, why am I not doing that? That helps a lot, you know, until it gets under your fingers. But it really does come down to, uh, to, to practicing it. I will write down ideas, like if I came up with a lick that I really love, and I like the fingering, I'll video it, I'll use my phone, I'll, I'll film it or I'll record the idea or I'll write it out really sloppily on tab. Doesn't matter about notes, who cares? No, we're not talking about that. Any kind of method that you can remember the lick and record it, that's important. Like on the phone, does it record on the on the on your phone, whatever the program is, um, audio messages, and then just catalog it and just listen back. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Because you know, in a few weeks time you might have forgotten that you came up with this cool lick and then you're like, oh man, there it is. Or in a few weeks' time, you might have realized that the lick you listen back to is um, something that has morphed into something else. And that's really cool. Like, I remember spending all this time when I was younger trying to play Alan Haldsworth licks and not realizing, you know, all sorts of stuff about him that he was. It was really, you're like, yeah, I could do this. You're like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> um, hey, well, thanks for got a top chat here. Thanks, uh, as Azili. Right here, any questions? Let me know. Um, appreciate it. Um, all right, want some questions? Uh, Jeff Tweedy's book on this is from Daniel. Um, how I write one song. That's cool. I got to check that out. I didn't know about that. I'll definitely check it out. Matt Gibson, how's it going, Matt? How you doing? Really enjoying the new workshop masterclass format, Jeff. Thanks, for, uh, Matt, and thank you for always being there. For a long time now, a real stal stalwart, Matt. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, okay. Uh, wow, I can finally tell you that I love what you are doing on here. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. That's from Stephen. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. I really enjoy doing it, too. Um, do you find that the music you're listening to when you're not playing somehow seeps into your playing? Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, absolutely, but only to a certain extent, then I have to work on it, right, if I really want to dig into it. But yeah, things will seep in. Other little things that I'll do, I'll play games, I'm watching TV, and if there's a melody, I'll try to find it, or if there's a pitch, I'll see if I can match it on the guitar. Little things like that, that works. And what's really cool about all this slow practice and deliberate practice is when you hear somebody else do it, you go, I know what that is, and it's memory. And that's a big part of this, right? You have the, you've got your, the memory of, of what it is, right? You're playing and you're like, oh, okay, oh, that guy just played that BB's box kind of lick thing. I know what that is. Okay, great. So even if it's something totally crazy, we just mentioned like Hallsworth, and if I, like, you know, like that, I can't even do it. It's kind of diminished lick like that, that I can't really play at the moment. I hear it and I go, I know what that is. Like, I can't play it, you know, necessarily as fast as he's doing it, but I know what it is. 
So that's what happens at any level. If you hear like, you know, the BB King lick, you know, or the Albert King lick, you know. That kind of stuff. Right, that whole thing. The Albert King stuff that Stevie kind of does a lot of too. Um, practice the crap out of that, right? So like, I haven't played in a long time. Okay. Right, that whole sort of thing. Spend a lot of time just working that, of course, killing your fingertips doing it. But I spend a lot of time just to get that thing together. I try not to play it too much, because every time you play it, you, I sound like I want to sound like Steve Ray Vaughan or Albert, Albert King. You will definitely buy your new course soon. Thanks, I appreciate it. If you use your home, uh, your phone to record an idea, it helps to give it a name rather than just a default recording number. Yes, I never do that. And I sit there and go, God damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's from Mike Gabby. That's a great piece of advice, man. Thanks. Um, super excited about your, your subscription uh, lesson project. Hope it's a blend of blues and blues rock and shred. It will be a, be a blend of all of those. But I think what I'm going to start doing at first is um, tunes, like working through a song, a few songs a month how you can play rhythm on them, how you can play lead on them, breaking them down, and learning uh, through, through example and using songs that you can actually use. I find that's a great way to, to, to move forward. So that's kind of what the, the general thing is going to start to be. It'll expand out. Um, an extra special thanks to everybody who picked up my guitar survival guide. Um, I really appreciate that too. Um, that's my reference guide that you guys have over there. And thanks, it's, it's been, it's, you guys have picked it up and I really, really appreciate it. Uh, okay, um, a little bit more. SRV got a lot from Albert King. Yes, he did. Um, if you watch Pawn Stars, every commercial break has a guitar, quick guitar riff that's worth trying to figure out. Yeah, like stuff like that, exactly, right? Anything, you know, just, there you go, you know. Um, do I actually have more than one course to buy? Oh my God, yeah. If you go to my website and you hear courses, I have like 34 True Fire courses available. And if you wanted them, please go through my website. There is, you can use the code LIVE20 and you get 20% off of everything. But if you go through my website and order it, um, it'll take you to True Fire, but I end up getting a greater percentage of the sale. So if you like what I do here, it's a great way to, to help me out. Um, so yeah, I've got lots of courses. Um, okay. I was told you can always tell a good guitar player by the way that they play acoustic guitar since it really shows the player's fault. I actually disagree with that. I'm not an acoustic guitar player. I don't have acoustic guitar player hands. Just like when you hear an acoustic guitar player play electric, it may not always be that great. And well, let's talk about that for a minute. Acoustic guitar is its own instrument onto its own if you want to play it like a master. Of course, some people can do that. You know, like Tommy Emmanuel can do anything. <laughs> but when you hear him on electric, you're like, Dang, that guy's good on electric too. But he's primarily an acoustic guitar player. Eddie Van Halen, arguably the greatest, you know, one of the greatest rock guitar players ever. Um, was, would he say he was a great acoustic guitar player? Probably not. I mean, he did Spanish flying acoustic and stuff, but he's an electric guitar player. So I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that that, um, it's like when people say, oh, when you start guitar, you should start an acoustic. I'm like, no, start an electric, you know, start on the thing that you love. If you love rock and roll guitar, then why play an acoustic guitar? So acoustic, remember um, uh, uh, Dole is Unplugged, right? On MTV when we were growing up. Um, listen to Nirvana once. It's a great performance, but sometimes you hear Kirk's hands failing him, right? Because he's not used to playing acoustic. How many times did he do this? That's a whole night of playing acoustic guitar when you're used to playing electric, right? I remember hearing that on the Alice in Chains one, which I thought was really great, but at some points, and he's a great guitar player, I'm not knocking him, my hands would be killing me too, right? If, I don't, if I'm not used to playing acoustic guitar, I'm playing tens on a Strat and a Les Paul, but man, if you're playing, you know, if you're trying to play, uh, you know, if you're trying to play 
um, 13s on an acoustic and you haven't done it in the old days, you're gonna, you're gonna get your, your butt handed to you. You know what I mean? It's really, really difficult. Okay, um, so what else we got going on here? Oh yeah, when, good old days when MTV actually played music. Yeah, I don't know this anymore. <laughs> I'm too old for that shit. Um, let me see what else. Um, oh, my uh, British Blues Masters is a great course. Thanks so much, guys. That's over. Um, you can get that through my website, jeffmackerlane.com, where I talk about David Gilmore, um, Jeff Beck, uh, Jimmy Page, and Eric Clapton. Um, all right. Okay, I uh, hope you're doing well. This is from Lucas. I've been studying all your courses on TrueFire. Thank you. Want to ask how much you would, want to ask you how you would approach learning, practicing multiple different styles and thoughts on finger style shred. Um, well, um, finger style, well, there's techniques, right? So um, you can't do it all. So you want to make a decision on what it is that you want to do because you, you can't do it all, um, unfortunately, right? So there are very few guys who can do that. I like my family a lot, so I don't want to practice all that much <laughs> to be able to kind of kill all those styles. Anybody who can do all that stuff. Like, I think, um, you know, Pat Metheny's famous for warming up for hours before doing any gig or anything like that. And same thing with... Uh, Tommy Emanuel, when, when Rick Beato inter interviewed him, he's like, oh, I've been up since whatever time in the morning um, practicing before this. So he's not just I improvising. He ran over what he knew he might play, so he warmed up. Um, i just say, you know, if you want to get a new technique together, um, start slowly and start to, to incorporate it. And I also try to think about how I'm going to use this. Like, you know, when I think about playing like Alan Hallsworth, which I, I can't and nobody can, but that whole thing, that's a whole different thing. Like, so this brings me back to something when I was talking about the J.K. Lee guitar. Alan Hallsworth used like eights or lighter and his action was this low. He barely picked tons of legato. I'm normally playing more traditional style guitars with either a 10 or my old Strats a seven and a quarter radius with uh, 10 gauge strings. It ain't gonna happen. You know, the guitars are, that's a big thing. When you see Steve I play, it's a lighter string, lower action, flatter fingerboard, thinner neck. If you're playing like a baseball bat neck and you're used to playing blues and you're like, I want to incorporate this thing, you have to be really honest with yourself because sometimes those guys' guitars are set up in a certain way. Eddie using nines, I love Michael Schenker, nines on a Gibson with a fair amount of gain. Not a ton, but you know what I mean? So these are things that are really important to think about. I don't know if that answers the question, but I mean, there's things that I, you know, I'll really be honest. I'll start practicing something, and after a little while, I'm like, I'm never going to use this. Like, there's that guy. That's that other guy's thing. I'm going to work on it, but I can maybe add some of it into my playing, but I, I try not to get too obsessed about it because it's so easy to, <laughs> to pull me away from what it is that I really want to do, right? If that kind of makes sense. Because when I start to sit down and play guitar, I guess I like having a new technique that I want to work in my playing. So for instance, at some point I really got into uh, using my pick and fingers. But that, that fell right perfectly into my guitar playing, right? Because all the music that I play, you know, blues and all this stuff, work, fingers work great. And then there's people that I started watching like, you know, um, well, David Grissom, he's one of my really great friends, but he didn't start off that way. He started off as a guy who started playing. He came to the National Guitar Workshop and he started playing and I was like, who is this guy? I didn't know who he was. And all this hybrid picking stuff. And I'm like, well, there is something I, I'd say I can do. I don't mean I can do what David does, but it was inspiring enough that I'm like, but I can work that into what I do. When I see someone like um, Tom Quayle, right? You guys know Tom Quayle with his ridiculous technique and he's got this very particular way of playing and it's so different from the way I play guitar, the way I hold the guitar. He picks super softly. Like it's, it would be a total reconstruction of the way I play the instrument. 
I don't want to do that. So my point is be honest with yourself and say like, is this something I really, really want to work on? Because it's easy for me to say I want to sound like Alan Haldsworth, but to do that, there's other things that are in play besides the amazing amount of talent that he had. Make sense? I know, a little rambly there, but those are my thoughts. <laughs> um, um, let's see what we got. This is uh, Soundstorm. Thanks for doing all you do. Um, introducing Peter Green. Oh, the biggest thing is Winston Colossus to me. Love it. Yeah, what a great record. Peter Green. Um, biggest thing is the Colossus. Oh, yeah. And, oh, right. And BB. Right. Thank you, man. Uh, it, that um, Tom Quill tunes to fourths. So that makes things <laughs> say easier. That diminishes what he's capable of doing. That facilitates him doing what he does. And he talks about it. Once again, I look at them like, oh, I wish I had that technique. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not going to do that. That's like my redoing everything. And um, I've heard him talk about playing blues, and that's not his thing, you know? So Steve I talks about that. Like, yeah, I'm not a blues player, you know? Um, all right. Any other questions, guys? Um, oh, yeah, I was going to dig out the Jake. So this is the... Uh, Plexi. So if I go to, uh, interestingly, the J. Key Lee with nines, you hear the difference. Oh, let me tune that up first. <laughs> Wow, weather's changed in New York. Hold on. Very interesting watching me tune. So yeah. My back, I'm back. All right. Yeah, I forgot to plug in this in. All right, I think I'm back, right? Let me know. I'm back, right? Okay, Charville knocked, knocked out. <laughs> Is the mic back in? It should be. Okay, good. So yeah, I forgot to char put in the charger on the mic. Cool. Um, I'm running late, that's why it's an hour, five, it's an hour and 20 minutes. Um, so. Like I was saying, it's um, the lighter strings has a certain sound. That kind of vibrato is only really... You can get out of thicker strings, yes, I can do that, but... You know, all, that, all that kind of stuff, you know, the 80s guitar sounds. Nines! Well, that stuff kind of just seems to work better with a little bit of a lighter string gauge. Um, and then 
legato stuff is easier too, and then we're super 12 through 16 radius, you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. So just for fun, I mean, that versus say, uh, I get that same vibrato, but the envelope's just a little different with that thinner string. Right? This is harder to do on 13s. Yeah, that's why I don't use 13s. That whole heavier string thing. Who cares? Who cares what gauge string you use? As long as it's easy for you to play. I can tell you, as that video that Rick pointed out totally uh, works great, is the lighter string gauge sounds better with more overdrive. Well, let me put, more overdrive sounds better with a lighter string gauge. Excuse me. There is just not as much low end. It's much more of a tighter focus thing. And it's really funny. As soon as I got that guitar and I put um, the tens on, the nines on, I was like, wow. Well, that's how you do it. That's why it suddenly sounds like Eddie or... Jakey Lee, or that, you know, that sort of sound. All right, so, um, this ain't helping people just beginning. Well, this is the end <laughs> of the broadcast. Um, are you trying to impress your guitar tech? Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, who are you trying to impress? I think I, Steve, I told you, my old guitar tech had said that to guitar tech, guitar repair guy, whatever, the best. I remember wanting to put like 11s on this or something. He's like, yeah, who are you trying to impress? Me? I'm like, that's a good point. I don't have these kind of big hands. Like, you know, Josh Smith's a friend of mine. And Josh uses super heavy gauge strings. Josh is a big dude, so he can play those. I don't have those kind of hands. I'm, I'm frail, <laughs> and so I can't do that. can't play um, those heavy strings like that, and I, I don't want to work that hard. I can't work that hard. Actually, I've had hand problems. I know what it would do to me. Um, it, would, it would cause hand problems. So... You know, everybody else, Bailey Gibbons used six, you know, eights, and B.B. King used eights. Whatever works for you is fine, however way you play it. Um, I sometimes find, though, with a lighter string gauge for the way I pick, uh, it's a relearning. So when I started playing that, it was like snappy, snap, 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 snap. And it still kind of is, uh, if you hear it acoustically, but do that with the gain, it doesn't have the same kind of thing. Um, yeah, so thicker strings work better for tuned down to E-flat. Well, if you tune down a set of tens to E-flat, it feels a bit more like nines. Right? So, um, super, super cool. So, fun thing that happened um, on the way to the forum was uh, the old bass player from my band uh, um, is the bass player for the Scorpions, which is kind of fun. And we lost contact with each other for many years. And then he, he contacted me on Facebook, which was funny. And I went to the Scorpions playing it at Madison Square Garden, and it was a ton of fun. I was, you know, backstage with the Scorpions, and I walked to the stage with them in Madison Square Garden. I was right behind them when they walked on the stage. It was kind of funny, but um, some kind of thing, like Matthias Jobs, uh, nines, light gauges, to play the way they do in that guitar sound. He's not using super heavy strings. It just doesn't have the sound. So you're using super heavy gauge strings, and you're playing like that kind of heavily more distorted guitar. Ingve uses really light strings. And that helps them play faster. It also has that tone that I'm talking about. But I was uh, saying about the thing about the, the Scorpions, it was fun because it, like the, the childhood, the 15-year-old Jeff would be freaking out because I love the Scorpions, uh, especially the early stuff. But I love the 80s stuff, you know, Blackout and Love at First Thing and all those. And his job is a great guitar player. Um, I'm a huge Michael Schenker fan, as you guys know, but um, he was only really into Scorpions for a very short period of time. Anyway, all right, any quick questions before I go? Um, uh, yeah, BB singing and Josh is telling his 13s. Yeah, he was at the house and pff, he had played his guitar, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I can't play this. How do you play it? Why do you do this to yourself? And uh, so, like I said, but it, it suits the way he plays. Um, it suited the way Stevie plays. It did not suit the way Steve Vai plays. It does not suit the way uh, Alan Haltworth or Eddie Van Halen play. Just doesn't, you know, it's all about what you're trying to play and how you're trying to play it. 
Okay, and I rocked you like a hurricane, man. Yeah, <laughs> Michael Cope, pretty funny. Um, I gotta say, man, you know, Rudolf Schenker is 73, and he's a giant, and he's buff. It's, I couldn't believe it. Just I said hi to him, and I'm like, wow, I should look that good. And so uh, my friend Pavel is the bass player. Like, now he works out like two hours a day, you know. He's really, really into it. And it shows. He just looked ridiculous. I'm like, wow, I need to start working out because I want to look like that when I'm older. Um, okay, can't think of any questions, but I love your teaching style. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So if you like what I do, you know, the best way to, to help me out, if you like the channel and stuff like that, of course, I always um, appreciate every the top chat, top chat and all that kind of stuff. But the workshops are great. I think if people get something out of it. I got my guitar reference guide. I think you guys will dig that if you don't already have it. Um, my True Fire courses, you go to jeffmackerlane.com. The True Fire courses, you use the, live, the feed live 20. Lose, use that code. You get 20% off, off, off every course. And um, yeah. So one last question there. Best course for phrasing in pentatonic blues rock style like you teach here. Um, yeah, yeah, Solo Explorer. That's over, if you go to my jeffmackerlane.com and you see the thing that, or it, then the link's below here. True Fire course, it's called Solo Explorer. It's playing over rock jams and being able to make some of the chord changes on the rock jams. And it's primarily pentatonic scales and how you can alter or add notes to your pentatonic scale to cover some of the modal ideas or the chord progressions. It's very basic in, a, um, in an understanding where if you know pentatonic, you're good to go. Any chance of a Schenker type course? Oh yes, there is. It's in the works, my friends. In the next few months, you can expect a cool hard rock course coming out from me uh, where I kind of talk about Michael Schenker and John Sykes and a bit of like Jake Ely, all the guys that influenced me in the 80s when I was in high school. I'm 54, so um, yeah. And more about like, you know, there's some difficult stuff to play in there, but it's more about building up the technique and easier ways that I've found to kind of hone in some of those skills as opposed to a video of just like, hey, just watch how fast I play. I don't, that doesn't help anyone, right? It's not, that's not teaching. I think there's a bit of, um, that can be really nice in terms of inspiration, like, oh wow, look at him, what he can do. But if the whole course is just like a look at me and then, you're like, well, great. Like, like I said, when you watch it, like go back to Alan Haldreth, his course, you're like, I learned nothing. Oh, I didn't. I other than going, he's a, a genius, you know, and I can't play like that. And he, the way he thinks of things is insane. And that's what makes him, that's what made him brilliant. Okay. Um, I appreciate everyone being here. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Um, I will see you all uh, two weeks probably, but met my workshop. Thanks to BB so much for doing everything, all the great work. Really appreciate it, BB, um, the man with the mostest. Don't forget if, if uh, Five Watt World Keith is still here tomorrow, he's got Rick Beato on. I'm going to go on there and I'm going to troll. All right. Love you guys. See you soon. Thanks.